Welcome everyone to Technology Basics, PC Troubleshooting and Maintenance. Thank you so much for joining us for today's event. Before we get started, I want to make sure everyone is comfortable using ReadyTalk, the webinar platform we are on. You can chat in to us using the box on the lower left side of your screen at any time to let us know if you need help, if you have any questions for our presenter, or if you just want to say hi and let us know from where you are joining. We will keep all lines muted so we get a clear recording that you can refer to and watch again at your convenience. You are also welcome to share it with your friends and colleagues. We license all of our webinars Creative Commons so you can share them out and spread them in your own community. We want to make these as useful as we can for people. Most of you will be hearing the audio play through your computer speakers. So if you are hearing an echo, you may be logged in more than once and will need to close an instance of ReadyTalk. If at any time the streaming audio falls out of sync with the slides on screen, we would invite you to dial into the toll-free number that Susan has chatted out in the chat window. That's a good alternative if you have any hiccups or weirdness with the streaming audio. That alternative phone line can be used with a phone or Skype uh, to help you get a better connection to the audio. If you lose your Internet connection, feel free to reconnect using the confirmation or reminder emails that you would have received. And if at any time you do dial into the phone number and it gets disconnected, just feel free to dial into that other number again at your convenience. You can also reach out directly to ReadyTalk Support at 800-843-9166. We are recording today's webinar and we will make it available on the TechSoup website. You can find all of our past webinars as well as upcoming events listed at TechSoup.org slash community dash events – sorry slash community slash events dash webinars. I'm sorry I read that wrong. You can also re uh, watch webinars on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash TechSoup video. Within a few days we will be sending this full presentation along with the recording out to you in an email. So keep an eye out for that for any parts that you may miss or want to rewatch. And you can tweet us today at TechSoup or using the hashtag TSWebinars. My name is Becky Wiegand and I'm the Webinar Program Manager here at TechSoup and I'm happy to be your host for today's event. I have been with TechSoup for 8 years, and prior to that was the accidental techie who uh, never had an IT or tech role in my life, but always ended up having to help manage the technology at the small nonprofits where I worked in Washington, D.C. and Oakland, California. So I've been in the position of having to troubleshoot with no real troubleshooting experience. So I hope that we'll get a lot out of this uh, webinar today from hearing from Spencer Day who is our expert on the line, the Outreach and Partnership Development Lead at Interconnection. And he is uh, – they're one of our donor partners, Interconnection is, for our refurbished computer initiative which is factory refurbished hardware that you can get, uh, computers, laptops, or desktop PCs, laptops, tablets, monitors, all that kind of stuff that you can get that are fabric factory refurbished uh, that come with warranties. I'll talk a little bit about that program later on. But I just wanted to mention that Spencer is joining us from Interconnection based out of Seattle. And he is a techie at heart, and he has worked uh, with organizations meager, mighty, and anywhere in between is what he said in his bio to help them bridge the technological divide. He leads their efforts to help underprivileged communities gain access to and understanding of the technology that is vital to their growth. So I'm really excited to have him joining us on the line today because he is an expert in a lot of these areas and can help give you some tips to start with that will hopefully save you some time and headaches and money in having to bring in external help if you don't have full-fledged IT staff at your organization. You'll also see in the back end assisting with chat Susan Hope Bard who is joining us here from TechSoup. She'll be on hand to help you uh, with any of your questions or to help with any audio or technical issues today. So looking at our learning objectives for today, what we are hoping that you'll get out of this is to gain a list of things to do to help first off maintain the computer hardware you already have, and to help you maintain your computer software because both of those are kind of key in helping you solve most of your problems <laughs> uh, that you may encounter. And then we want you to become more confident with these first steps on how to troubleshoot. So we want you to feel a little bit more able to go in and defrag your computer or go in and uh, you know, just rebooting things so that it can start up quicker, like shutting down apps that start on 
on startup. Things like that. We want you to feel a little bit more confident about those. And then I also would hope that you would learn a little bit about hardware and software options if and when you decide you need to upgrade machines because that is also a big part of the process of any kind of technology planning is looking at what you have and deciding, is this actually working for our needs? Maybe it is now, and here are some things to keep it working. Maybe it's not, or maybe it won't be in six months, and you really need to be budgeting for how you can improve your technology over time. So those are the objectives we have for today, and we also hope to answer your questions along the way. Uh, before we get started with the topic at hand, for those of you who aren't already familiar with TechSoup, we are a nonprofit as well, and we are working toward connecting everybody uh, at nonprofits, libraries, and foundations, churches, with the technology to help them succeed at fulfilling their missions. We are everywhere on this map that is blue, so that's pretty much everywhere with the exception of a handful of embargoed countries. You can find our donation programs like well, we're not in the Sudan unfortunately. You know, so we are not in every place, but we are in many of them. I'd love it if you would chat into us right now and let us know from where you are joining today. Uh, because I imagine most of you are joining from the United States just based on the time zone of this webinar. But if you are joining us from outside the United States, I would recommend giving a visit to our TechSoup.Global site and selecting your country from this dropdown so that you can find the local program in your area or region that will serve your donation needs and technology needs as you move forward. But everyone is welcome to join us for our webinars. Um, I want to dive in to some poll questions right now to get an idea of where you are at, the people who joined us on this webinar today. We have about 100 people in the room. And thank you all of you who are chatting in to let us know from where you are joining. But I would love it if you would answer this poll question by clicking on one of these radio buttons on your screen. What's your role in maintaining or managing computers at your organization? Um, maybe you don't actually do any of the hands-on troubleshooting or maintenance. Maybe you help out because you don't have any IT staff, which was always my situation. People would look at me and say, you're young. You must know how to fix the server. And I would say, I know how to set up your MySpace back in the early 2000s <laughs> and laugh at them. Um, but it often was my role without any IT staff on hand. Maybe you manage all of the PCs and technology as part of your role. Maybe that's your job. Maybe you are the technical staff. And if there is a different role that you have, go ahead and comment in chat. Maybe you are the person that helps manage a tech vendor or a contractor that you work with, and it's your role to sort of liaise with them as problems come up. Uh, I have people chatting in. Charles mentions, we have a solid IT partner, but I troubleshoot as able. So that's great. You have somebody you can rely on for, for bigger technical needs, but you have somebody you can call in when needed. But when you don't need them, you do a little troubleshooting. Uh, we have Laura commenting, I help out, but have IT we can turn to particularly by phone. Uh, Diane comments that she's in that accidental techie role. That's what we like to call. Um, Jay comments, I lead the group of volunteer techies. So a lot of different scenarios out there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show the results. So it looks like we have a, a big chunk that's in the not really managing technology by choice, but you don't have IT staff. And then we have a sizable chunk that manage PCs and technology in their role. So keep in mind that we have framed this webinar as um, technology basics. So we are going to talk about PC maintenance and troubleshooting, but we are looking at it from sort of the basics uh, and moving on from that. But we won't be covering advanced topics today. So if you are joining us as a network admin or somebody who is a more higher end uh, tech expert, you may not get a whole lot out of this event, though you are totally welcome to stay and, and participate with us. And you may have tips to share that we can share back out with the audience. But we are gearing this webinar toward those technology basics, the things that you want to make sure you are starting out with uh, that anybody can do whether they have tech expertise or not. And then one other question for you. Uh, how many computers are you helping to maintain? And this just gives us an idea of maybe the types of issues you would encounter. If, you're, if you really don't have any computers that you are maintaining and you are just interested in picking up some skills or some interesting information, that's totally fine. Uh, if you're smaller than 20, then maybe you are dealing with an office that's not networked, that doesn't have an Exchange server, or isn't using a cloud file sharing service like Office 365. Um, we won't get into Exchange and, and 
kind of the bigger, more complicated networked issues. We want to look at these, this kind of from an individual PC standpoint today. But maybe you're helping manage a computer lab of public computing machines. All of this is helpful for us to get an idea of. So feel free to chat in if those are the things that you're encountering as well. And I'll just give a couple more seconds so that everybody has a chance to respond. And it looks like we've got a sizable group that are managing 20 or more machines, almost 30%. Um, but if we add up all those smaller groups, uh, it's about half that are dealing with uh, fewer than 20 computers, more than half actually. So that's really helpful to get an idea of. Uh, thank you for taking the moment to respond to those questions. I want to go ahead and jump us into the content at hand today and invite Spencer to the line to talk us, uh, to us about those basic computer maintenance and troubleshooting uh, tips that he can share with us today so that we can come away having a bit more confidence in how we do this when we're encountering a problem and how to hopefully set things up so that you're not having to react all the time to, oh my gosh, something's broken. Welcome to the program, Spencer. We're so glad to have you join us. Hi, Becky. Thank you for having me. I'm, uh, I'm really, really excited to be here. Um, we've, Interconnection has been uh, working with TechSoup uh, before, as, as you said earlier, but um, this is definitely something that we wanted to, to jump on and, and be a part of is, is to help out this network because I know how important it is for people to have the tools necessary to, to keep their computer running, keep it going. Um, it's so crucial in today's day and age that we have uh, our technology still up and running, ready for us whenever we need it um, because it's, it's used for uh, networking, it's used for um, you know, working on documents, uh, video editing, um, picture editing, all, all sorts of stuff. So yeah, I, I definitely uh, think that this is going to be a, a great opportunity to kind of cover some of the basics. And I hope that I, I can help out um, to everyone that is out there today. Um, to start off, uh, basically, I, I just wanted to give you some confidence that, that this, some of these things are very simple. These, these are easy things that you can do to keep your computer healthy. Uh, so don't feel powerless. Don't feel like uh, this is completely out of your uh, range. You, you can do this. Um, if you can log on to a webinar, you can definitely do some of these things. Um, so my two objectives for, day, for today are to, uh, one, learn more about your computer's capabilities, um, and then two, learn how to better protect your computer. Um, I think if we can accomplish those two things, you're going to feel a lot better about um, the maintenance of your computers moving forward. Um, and, and having said that, IT help, uh, we discussed earlier, um, it, it can be necessary. There are certain circumstances where uh, things are out of your, your depth. You, know, you are out of your depth, and that's fine. Um, that's, that's the reason why you have the, the support system. They, they do charge money. Um, it is uh, a little bit um, uh, pricey at times, especially for non in the nonprofit world, because Intercon Interconnection is a nonprofit, and we were bootstrapped just the same way as uh, many of you out there. Um, so we know exactly what it's like to, to try to do things like this on a shoestring. Um, but uh, I just wanted to let you know that the, this is going to get you to a certain point, um, and, and hopefully it will help uh, the vast majority of you to keep uh, you know, the simple problems away from your computers. Um, so we're going to launch into the next slide. Uh, it's going to talk about computer setup. This is just our foundation. Uh, what I wanted to cover with this is uh, verify your computer's plugged in. I, I've had, uh, so I started out as a, a technician um, a long time ago fixing computers, and I, I have had so many customers come into me over the years and talk about how their computer oh, is just not powering on. Um, and there are plenty of circumstances where actually like the wall outlet didn't have power to it. A fuse blew uh, for that particular wall outlet. So their computer isn't powering on because there's no power to the computer. Um, it's just not possible. So verifying that everything is plugged into the computer, verifying that there is in fact power to the outlet uh, is very important so that we can, uh, we can start working on the computer and making sure that the computer actually works. Um, the next part is uh, making sure that your computer has Internet connection. Um, either by Ethernet connection with a, a cable uh, or connecting through Wi-Fi. Um, so just verifying that you have a connection uh, is, is very, very important, obviously. Um, 
the next part, and this is probably the most important part about your computer setup, is making sure that it is in a good location. Um, cool, dry place, well ventilated. Uh, one of the bigger issues that I see uh, in the repair world for computers is that people will take their laptop and they'll set it on their bed um, and it will trap all that heat into your computer. Uh, or you'll take your desktop and you'll shove it into a drawer of a desk uh, where there's no ventilation. It just traps the heat. Uh, heat is very, very bad for computers, uh, as I'm sure you can imagine. Uh, but most people uh, just, it, it doesn't occur to them about that uh, because they're not feeling the heat. It's not, it's not present to them. So um, that, that's something that's very, very important. Keep it well ventilated so that it can cool itself because a fan is the only thing, uh, for the most part, that will cool your computer. Um, dry, obviously, that is very, very important. I had a lady the other day that came in and she, um, her desk in her house uh, is r right in the kitchen next to her pet's dog bowl. And she put her desktop down on the ground right next to the dog bowl. And her computer one day magically stopped working. And of course, it was because there was water damage because her dog likes to drool. And so it's things like that you, you need to be very careful of. Um, obviously, like uh, pet hair or something of that nature, um, these things can get sucked into the computer. Dust can be a uh, a factor, so make sure that it's in an area that um, can be, uh, you know, is, is away from all of the traffic, uh, but is still um, capable of staying cool and dry. Um, so on the next slide, we're talking about operating systems. Um, to kind of set the stage for this uh, in, in discussing software and hardware, I wanted to address the fact that. Um, Probably a lot of you are on different operating systems within Windows. I'm not going to really cover Mac because there's that's a whole different issue. Um, there are different instructions for that. Um, so I'm just going to stick to Windows. Um, however, I, I know that there are probably many of you that still have machines that are all the way back at XP, um, all the way up to Windows 10, which is the most current one. Um, first off, for Windows XP and Vista, that is no longer supported by Microsoft. Um, and that's I, that, that's difficult because those machines are no longer capable of doing uh, a lot of the processes that are out there in today's day and age. So um, those are very difficult to keep in good shape, uh, keep ma uh, maintained, um, just because there's there's no support from Windows for it. Um, so that, that's something to be cognizant of. That's something to remember whenever you have a machine like this. Is if if you're having compatibility issues with some of the programs you're trying to run and you're running Windows Vista or XP, that's uh, probably a good reason why is because these systems are outdated. Um, Windows uh, or Microsoft is uh, going to stop support for Windows 7 and Windows 8. Windows 7 they're going to stop support in uh, November and in Windows 8 they have already stopped supporting that. Um, because Windows is going to the same model that Apple is where they only support one uh, operating system at a time. So Windows 10 is going to be their operating system. Um, so that's not anything to panic about, but over time uh, you're going to notice that those operating systems are going to slowly fall behind. Um, we at Interconnection have been using Windows 7 for a long time because it's very, very stable. Um, and it's been a good operating system for us whenever we refurbish computers. Um, but we think that this is a good move to Windows 10 and we're going to wholeheartedly embrace it. Um, so how, how does that relate to the computers that are out there? There are plenty of computers that are in this world that are not capable of going to Windows 10. And so it, it's very uh, difficult for me to give you a hard and fast piece of advice as far as um, capabilities for computers whenever there's you know, all different types of computers in the world. So um, what I'm going to try to do is give you advice that will apply to Windows 7 through Windows 10. Um, and it, if, if there is any difference, it's very small um, for as far as like the instructions for how to get the desired result. Um, but most of this will be geared towards both Windows 7 and Windows 10. Um, so the next slide. Um, Updating your operating system. Um, I can't recommend this enough. Updating is very, very important. This is uh, Microsoft's way 
of keeping your computer in good shape, making sure that it is uh, compatible with all of the programs that are available to it at that day and time. Um, also, it is uh, updating it so that you are protected from some of the more malicious uh, um, antivirus or viruses and uh, trojans and those types of things that are out there in the world. So um, I, I think it's very important for you to keep your machine updated as much as possible. However, um, and this isn't a hard and fast rule, but don't upgrade your operating system unless you know what you're doing. That is a, a, a very, very um, big step for your computer and you need to be uh, aware of the risks if you make an update or an upgrade to your system rather than an update. Those are two completely different things. <clears throat> Upgrading your system is going from uh, Windows 7 to Windows 10 or Windows 8 to Windows 10. Updating it is just uh, you know, getting it to the newest version from Windows 10 to the newest version of Windows 10. Um, so it's, it's definitely uh, an important distinction between the two. Um, I, I'm not saying that uh, upgrading is bad. I'm simply saying that there, there are machines, laptops that are, say, five to seven years old, that um, drivers are not out for your, your screen, for, for video, for audio. Your, your speakers might not work. Your mouse might not work. So um, that, those are the things that you could run into because it's just not updated enough. Uh, Windows 10 is very new. So these are things to consider, and you may need to call someone um, that has better knowledge of something like this if you don't feel comfortable with uh, making that upgrade and risking having some issues uh, whenever you make that upgrade. Um, so don't want to belabor the point, but uh, that's the difference between the two, and just be careful if you're making an upgrade. Um, the next one is talking about startup programs. Um, the importance here, and, and we're going to start uh, delving into how to actually make your computer more efficient, more um, uh, just quicker for you, uh, faster reacting. That's, that's kind of the name of the game because it, it is a pain in the butt whenever you have a computer that just takes forever to load anything. It takes forever to uh, get online once you uh, first open it up and started it. Um, that's, that bugs everyone. So uh, starting from the very beginning, the programs that launch right whenever you open your computer, um, I, I think it is crucial to go through this you know, periodically, say once every two or three months, to see what it is that is running with your computer. Um, the, the way that you can check this is to go to, um, and I've got a couple boxes right there that will show you this, but msconfig. Uh, in, your, in your Windows search bar, which the Windows search bar is down there. Uh, whenever you click Start, there's a search bar there. Um, and we're going to keep going back to this because this is a great way for you to find whatever it is on, on your laptop that you're looking for. Um, if you type msconfig into it, and then uh, whenever it, uh, you select msconfig the program, um, and, and the box pops up there, if you select the Startup tab, it'll list all of the programs that launch whenever your computer is started. Um, and so then you can select which ones you want uh, enabled or disabled. Now, now is a, a good time to uh, just make sure and, and be clear that whenever you are choosing some of these things, make sure that you know what that thing is doing. So if Skype pops up there and you're like, hey, I never use Skype, you can disable that and that's fine. Um, but if something comes up there and you don't know what it is, don't touch it. That, that's my recommendation. Um, you can Google it and try to find out better uh, what it is. But um, it, it can be dangerous if you just get in there and start uh, closing out everything. So um, I think this is a good way to pare down how many programs are, are launched at the very beginning. Um, hardware. So hardware is an important part of uh, selecting computers that are good for you and recognizing whether the computers that you have are still capable of what it is that you want them to do. Um, so hard drive space is very, very important. Um, it lets you know as your hard drive fills up, your computer is going to slow down because there's just more things that your, uh, your hard drive has to sort through to be able to find the information that you need. Um, being able to find out uh, how much space you have left on your hard drive. Um, I have instructions on here. It says open uh, file explorer. Um, that's uh, the little file that's down there in the bottom left. You select that, and then whenever the window pops up, you select this PC. Um, it'll pop up with your uh, your hard drive, your C drive that's there. 
um, and it will show you however many gigabytes or terabytes. Hopefully you don't have megabytes because uh, that computer is a little bit old then. But um, if you have a certain portion of uh, gigabytes that are available, um, that will let you know your capacity. Uh, next one is RAM. Um, and I don't want to get too bogged down in uh, the technical details here, but um, essentially RAM is memory. It's, it's called random access memory. It is memory that is available uh, to you to work through things. Um, this is your quick instant memory that allows you to quickly work through things. The more RAM you have, the more things you have available to you to work on at one point in time. So if you're one of those people that has uh, a ton of programs open all the time and a ton of tabs open all the time, your RAM is what is going to dictate whether you are able to uh, manage all of those things at the same time or not. Eventually you will um, you will fill up your space. And so I have instructions there to check to see how much RAM you are currently using on your computer. Um, type resource monitor into your Windows search bar. Uh, select the memory tab and it will show you uh, how much of the RAM you have available. And, and people will have like 4 gigs, 2 gigs, 4 gigs, 8 gigs on up to 16 or 32 gigs uh, even. Um, so that's just a good way to check and see uh, how many how much of that you're using. Uh, the processor is the brains. Um, it, is, it is what wor actually works through all of that. So the RAM, the RAM is what uh, it, it makes available all of the information needed to quickly work on it. Processor is what actually works on it. Um, so this, is, uh, this tells you what your computer is going to be capable of working on. Um, some processors are older than others, um, and that, that will dictate what you are capable of doing. So if you have a bunch of computers that you're managing, and they are, um, you know, say Core 2 Duos or something like that, but you need to do video editing, um, these Core 2 Duos are older and they're not capable of handling that. Whereas if you get to an i5 or an i7, um, that, that will get into the territory where they are a little bit more capable of handling what it is that you do um, on your computers. Now if you're just doing web surfing and checking your email, then it's not necessary for you to have an i7 computer. Um, you can have one because, hey, it's fun, but um, you don't necessarily need it. Uh, so keeping your, we just touched on the hard drive. Um, what this defragmentation does is it uh, compiles the information that you have stored on your hard drive, which, which stores all of your information on your computer. Um, it takes that and it compiles it in a way that is very easy to find. Um, so picture your spice rack in your house. Um, if you have your spices all over the place, you're going to have to search through all of them to be able to find them. Um, whereas if you have them organized by you know, Italian spices and uh, spicy stuff and salt and pepper and that kind of thing, um, it will make it easier for you to find exactly what it is that you're looking for. That's exactly what this is doing. It's, it's uh, arranging it so that it's an easier way for it to sort through and find what it is that it needs. Um, so I, I've listed instructions on here for uh, everyone to find uh, the disk defragmentation uh, program. Um, File Explorer, this PC, and then right click on Windows C and go down to the bottom of the box and select Properties, um, and that will pop up with a new box. Uh, within that new box you can select Tools, and uh, on that Tools tab you'll have Disk Defragmenter or Optimize. It just depends on whether you're on uh, Windows 7 or Windows 10. Um, and once you select that, it will pop up with that program, the disk defragmentation program. And you'll see all of your drives available to you. So then you can select uh, the Windows C drive, which is your hard drive, um, and then you can choose to defragment it. Now on some of these systems, it will allow you to set that up as a schedule to where it will do it in the background. It will do it for you. Um, it will say, hey, would you like to do this every week or every two weeks at 2 a.m. in the morning? Um, so that, that makes it easier for you so that you don't have to deal with this all the time and think about it. But I do think this is something that should be done periodically because um, it just kind of keeps uh, all of your files nice and neat. and every, uh, it, it will help your computer uh, run a bit quicker. Uh, so I think that's important. Um, on this next slide, this actually, so this is for check disk. This is a different tool that Windows has. Um, but this shows you the box there that I was talking about um, where you select the Tools tab. Um, and you'll have available both disk defragmentation and also uh, error checking, which is the check disk tool. Um, what check disk does 
is it scans your hard drive to find file errors and it fixes them. Um, if it can, if not, then it will block off those sectors, but um, it, it does everything it can to fix some of those file errors that happen over time. Now these file errors are um, some of these unseen things that you're like, why is this program not working? Why is it uh, glitching or why is it catching? Um, or uh, th yeah, there are several circumstances that, that these can uh, play out and cause issues with your computer. So uh, this is another great thing for you to do um, so that you can uh, keep your computer running well. Uh, the process to get to this obviously is, is very, very similar, um, but all you're going to do is go to that and select, uh, you know, check, uh, check disk. Um, once you select that, a box will pop up, which we show there, um, and I would recommend selecting both of the options that are available um, and then clicking check. Now, um, with Windows 7, it won't check immediately. What it will do is it will say, uh, uh, we can't check it now. We are going to check your disk uh, whenever you reboot the computer, whenever you restart it. Um, so that, that's uh, something, you know, you don't have to do it immediately. There's no uh, pressure as far as that's concerned, but it'll, it's like scheduled for the next time that you reboot your computer. Um, so that, I, I think that's uh, also set aside some time. Whenever it's, it's doing a, an error checking, um, it, it can take 30 to 45 minutes. Um, it just kind of depends on the size of your hard drive and how many things you have on it, but um, that does take some time. So it just, you know, if you're shutting down your computer at the end of the day, maybe it might make sense for you to restart it and let it go through the restart process so that it will check your, uh, your hard drive as you leave and you can come back in the morning and it's ready to go. Um, next slide. Close your tabs and apps, please. Um, now my wife isn't listening to this, but I've given her this advice numerous times. Never works. Um, I, I completely get it on my computer right now. I actually have a bunch of tabs open, so I'm totally guilty. But um, this is something that definitely slows down your computer. People leaving uh, their web browser open with several windows with a ton of tabs open. Um, programs are also uh, a big culprit. So you'll have uh, Word and Excel and PowerPoint and uh, Adobe Acrobat and all of these programs that are, are constantly running at the same time it causes your computer to get bogged down. It just can't handle all of these uh, processes that are going on at the same time. Um, and closing down the tabs and apps that you have, or, or as many as you can, um, will help it be more efficient, will help it run better. Um, I, I like to say that whenever you have tabs that you go to every day, like for instance, I go to Salesforce every single day. I don't need to leave that one open whenever I leave work at the end of the day because I know I'm going to have to go to it the next day. But if there's a page that I need, I'm, I'm working on a document, or there's a page that I need to come back to the next day and it's a reminder, again, you can leave it open. That's, that's totally fine. But this is just a good practice to get into so that you, uh, um, you keep things a little bit orderly and, and your computer is able to handle uh, a lot of the tasks that are going on a little bit better. Um, I am perennially programs. guilty of that, Brian. Or, sorry, Spencer. I was responding to somebody oh. named Brian in the chat. I uh, have about 40 tabs open at any given time, so that's a really good reminder to me to do that as well. Um, I'm going to let you keep going. I just wanted to interject to uh, share yeah. that I am I am like your wife and guilty in that, <laughs> as I'm sure many well, of us I, are. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm, I totally get it. I'm, I'm there too. It's just, I, I keep tabs open at – I'm sure a lot of people are like that. I keep tabs open as much as a reminder for me to go back and do certain things as anything. Um, so I, I totally get it. But it's just it's one of those things where if you if you don't close those down, um, it your computer is still working to keep those available to you. That's 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 what it's doing. So um, not not going through and closing those down um, just taxes your computer and it, it forces it to work. Uh, too hard, uh, and, and then you start wondering why whenever you open up this new program, it's taking forever. That's why. It, it has all these things that it says, okay, I'm juggling 50 things that I'm trying to make available to you. Um, eventually, your computer is going to cry uncle. Um, so for the next uh, slide, uh, uninstall programs. This one is uh, very, very important. If you have the, the ability to do this, uh, this can help you remove unwanted programs or programs that you're no longer using. So I guess those are still unwanted. But uh, 
really programs that got onto your computer that shouldn't be on there. Um, that that's a, a great way to handle this this issue. Um, if you go into the search bar, type in uninstall programs, um, and then there there will be a a program that pops up that says uninstall or remove programs. Select that, and the window that pops up will show you a list of all the programs that are on your computer. Um, uh, going back to the startup programs, if you don't know what a program is, don't remove it. Um, just don't get into a situation where you're taking away stuff that you need. Um, normally Windows will protect you against that, but it's still just a good practice to not uh, delete anything that you don't know what it is. Um, I still would recommend Google searching it and trying to find out what it is, because generally there's pretty good information out there. Um, and it, worst case scenario, contact somebody that uh, has more knowledge than you and say, hey, do you know what this is? Um, or call, uh, call Interconnection. I don't, I, you know, we, we'd be happy to talk to you about it. But stuff like that, just make sure that what you're, um, what you're removing from your, your computer you actually want to remove. Um, so all you'd have to do is just uh, find the program that you want um, and right click on it and select uninstall. Now sometimes it will pop up with the uh, Windows version of uninstall which is very simple and you just follow the prompt. Sometimes it will pop up with uh, say you're uninstalling like McAfee or something of that nature. Um, McAfee will have their own uninstall uh, program that will that will pop up and you'll have to follow the prompts and it'll say, do you want to uninstall it? And I'll say yes. And they'll say, do you really want to install it? I'll say yes, yes. And then it'll ask you another four times and then finally you'll get to uninstall it. But um, generally speaking, all you have to do is just follow the prompts and it'll get you to where you want to be, which is uh, uninstalling the programs that you don't need. Uh, going back to the hard drive space, these are ways for you to keep uh, your hard drive as, as free as possible. Um, and not uh, as full as you can possibly get it. Um, you want to keep as much space as possible on that hard drive um, in order to make sure that it's still running well um, and that it doesn't get uh, just overstuffed, overloaded. Uh, next slide. Antivirus software. Um, so this is a this is a biggie right here, and I can go in a number of ways with this, but basically what I'm I'm going to talk about is the free version. Um, there are several out there that you have to pay for, and um, you know that's, that's all well and good. What these are, these are just base levels of protection. These should not be viewed as a catch-all that is going to protect you against anything and everything that's out there, because frankly, there is no such thing, um, short of you just not uh, having internet. Um, but antivirus software is a good way to have a, a base level of protection. Um, so. Microsoft Security Essentials is something that is from Microsoft. So it works natively with Windows. So you're not going to have any compatibility issues. Um, most of the paid software uh, that's out there for antivirus works very well. But this is made by Microsoft for Windows. It, it works very, very well, obviously. Um, and it does a good job of protecting uh, your computer for free. So it, it's it's obviously a really good option. Um, the, the way to enable it, and I, I want to take a second here and, and discuss this. Um, if you are trying to put this on your computer, you need to be very sure that you don't have another um, antivirus program on your computer. That is very, very important. Um, all too often I see somebody that will have two, three, four antivirus programs on their computer and their computer has locked up because you have antivirus programs competing against each other. One saying, hey, this one's trying to take control of this computer. I'm trying to segment it off. And the other one's doing the exact same thing. And eventually what happens is you get these uh, freezes and glitches and stuff gets locked up and it's just not good. Um, make sure that you have only one uh, antivirus program going at any point in time. Um, uh, security Essentials is easy to turn off. It's very, very simple. Um, but if you have anything else that's on your computer um, and you're about to launch this, I would recommend uninstalling it personally. Um, I would go through the program or process that we just discussed, make sure that it is completely uninstalled and gone from your computer, and then launch this because that's uh, you just don't want them competing. It, it, there's no reason for your computer to get locked up because of an antivirus program. You think you got a virus, but actually it's your antivirus uh, program that is 
that is uh, shutting down your computer. So that's definitely frustrating. Um, so to be able to enable it, uh, go to the search bar, type in Microsoft Security Essentials or Windows Defender. The difference between those two is just generations. So between Windows 7 and Windows 10, it's the same thing. It's just uh, they named it differently um, in the effort of better branding, I guess. Um, so if you type that in, uh, it'll pop up with the, the program, uh, your antivirus program. And in the settings uh, tab, all you have to do is select on there, and it, it will it will launch. All, all you have to do is just select that you want it to turn it on. Um, and then you can also set it up with a schedule if you want to where it will run uh, at 2 in the morning or, or what have you so that it will check to see whether there's any virus or anything like that on your computer. Um, and it will also keep itself updated so you don't have to do any of the updating for it. So that, that's definitely uh, a good scenario for keeping your computer protected. Um, good internet practices. So uh, like I said earlier, antivirus software is uh, a good base level, but it's not a catch-all. Um, there are tons of things I could give an entire presentation just on this, on internet practices, but the quick and dirty is that exit out of pop-ups, uh, unless it is something that you know of, don't click inside the, the window. That's a great way to download something that you don't want on your computer. Um, Microsoft or Apple will never try to contact you through a pop-up. I can't tell you how many times I, I have to take away viruses from people's computer or reload the operating system and wipe it completely clean and reload it because um, they and, – and these con artists are very, very good at what they do. They, they send you messages that look very real. Um, I promise you, Microsoft or Apple is not going to contact you through a pop-up. I can guarantee it. Um, so you don't you, you don't need to worry about that. Um, and then the the last one there is adblockplus.org. Um, this is just something. It's an extension that works with your browser. So basically, what it's trying to do is prevent these pop-ups from uh, opening up to you. Um, there there are a number of things that you could choose for this to block uh, pop-ups. This is just one that I have experience with, and I, I feel like it's a pretty good one. I'm not going to go through the walk, uh, like the setup for this um, because it, it'll take a little bit. But if you go to their website, they do a good job of uh, showing you how to install this on your browser. Um, and the the last one is other tools. Um, if you feel like you have the capability of going a little bit further than what I've I've listed here today. Um, these are a couple tools that, that can possibly help you. Malwarebytes is good at finding malware on your computer, which is the uh, probably the biggest uh, uh, problem with computers today is malware getting on your, your computer, I, I would say. Um, so that's a good program. That's also free. There's a free version of mal Malwarebytes. So that's something that you can check into. Um, and then Safe Mode on your computer. Um, it's a diagnostic tool for Windows, but it's not um, – it, it's not very easy unless you have good diagnostic skills to identify problems. I, I wouldn't really recommend getting into it um, unless you know what you're doing. That, that's the only thing that I would say. Is for, I, I wanted to address that because um, I've had people ask me, you know, well, should I put my computer in safe mode so that it'll be it'll be safe and it'll be okay? Well, that, that's not exactly what it's for. What it's for is it shuts down almost all programs and runs just bare bones so that you can start adding things to identify. What is, what is going on with your computer. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to address that really quick. Um, that is it. Basically, I, I, I wanted to ask if there are any questions out there for me. Uh, I'd be happy to address them. Great. Thank you so much for that, Spencer. A lot of really great tangible practical tips in a short amount of time here. And we hope that mm -hmm. there were some that were new for uh, folks in our audience. Um, we Actually, have a couple of questions. Quick. Oh, go ahead. Real sure. quick. Uh, um, they were talking about, I, I just saw something on the chat from the chairperson, uh, malwarebytes.org, not .com. I think that's very important. Um, there are going to be a lot of, there's a lot of misinformation from stuff that you can download, and you can definitely download something that is not what it uh, says it is. Um, so I, I didn't address that, and I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Right. No, that's a great point. I did chat that out. That was actually chatted into yeah. us by uh, one of the participants who made that clarification. Yeah. Um, and it's a great point too that if something pops up, I, I hate those pop-ups that wiggle on your screen that say like, ooh, your antivirus is out of date. Update now. Uh, I think those are almost always not what they project themselves to be, <laughs> not what they present mm -hmm. themselves as. So, uh, you know, 
go to reputable sources. I shared the link to TechSoup Security section in the chat as well where we have uh, a lot of articles. Uh, we have a whole guide that's uh, 12 tips to staying safer online. And you know, the number one thing that keeps you safe more than even an antivirus product is um, just your own behavior. So don't click on the file. Don't open the link unless you're really sure you know who it's from. If you get those fake FedEx emails uh, that say, oh, you have a package that's being held up, click the link below. That's that's just not how they do it. So um, you know, your own behavior can be the biggest predictor of how much spam and uh, malware and virus stuff you end up on your machine. So lots of great resources there to share. Let's see, we've got uh, some questions, a couple that are related. Um, Jane and Don both asked questions, uh, and, and I think there was even someone else who asked about if you set your computer up to make updates, or if you set your computer up to defrag at 2 in the morning, which you recommended a couple of times, uh, both with defragging, you could do it in the middle of the night, or with um, updating your antivirus or things like that. Do you need to leave your computer on all night, and is that problematic to leave computers on all night? Like, should we be question. shutting down every day? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, most of the computers in today's day and age are fine running uh, nonstop. Now, if you have a laptop, and you leave it plugged in, um, leaving your computer plugged in overnight, um, it basically it's continuing to put a charge into your battery. So that can fatigue your battery, and it will reduce the battery life. Um, so there is something to be said for that. But if you have a desktop, it's no worries. Like the, they are made basically to run uh, nonstop. Um, so that's, that's not that big of an issue. Um, as far as uh, running overnight, if you're doing this once, uh, and I would recommend probably once every two weeks. It's not that big of a deal as far as um, defragging your computer. Um, checking for updates, it's just whenever they come in. And normally they don't take that long, so you wouldn't need to let that run overnight. Um, and doing check disk. If you, if you did stuff like that, once every two weeks to a month is, is plenty. That, that should be more than enough. So it, it shouldn't be that big of an issue as far as um, wearing down the life of your computer. Great. That's helpful to, to get some perspective on that. Um, we had some folks asking about uh, Norton security in particular um, and, and how to renew that. So I'll just respond to that quickly, that if you've received licenses of Norton Antivirus or Norton Security through TechSoup's donation program, it is an annual subscription. So you just request that same license again, which I think is you know, $10, and they sell it in bundles. So if you need it for 20 computers or, or something like that, there's a series of different bundles. I think for 5 devices, 10 devices, 20 devices, um, something of that ilk. And you can find, the, you can find that product uh, directly by going to TechSoup.org slash Symantec, which is the company, company that makes Norton. Or you can just go to TechSoup.org slash security, and you'll see all of the different security products that are available in the donation program and how they work. Um, Let's see, we have a question about, Jordana asked about those pesky pop-ups that ask you to update. Is there a way to turn those off or shut those down uh, so that you aren't getting them all the time? Or do you recommend just telling it to run whenever it happens so that you don't have to accept or in more cases than often I imagine reject the update and say you'll do it later and have that continue being a thing you click out of and say you'll do it later for three months straight? Is there a way to get rid of that? Um, so I, I see that there are a couple about updates. One is about the uh, Windows 10 update, um, and then the other one is about the pop-ups for updates. Um, Windows has tried to get away from the pop-ups. Um, so with each new uh, um, iteration of Windows, they have done a better job of getting away from it because Vista was uh, – everybody was really critical about the fact that there are just tons and tons of pop-ups for, uh, for Vista. So. Um, they're trying to get better, but essentially it's, it's trying to tell you there's something that needs to be done. Now, for Windows 10 on the update, that is one thing that um, I will be critical of Microsoft on. Um, they are putting, hey, update to Windows 10 down on the bottom corner of your screen, and then they'll have pop-ups that come up all the time. Um, it, it is very, very annoying. I completely get it. Um, and a lot of computers that they are doing that pop-up on are not capable of going up to Windows 10. So that's that's definitely something that's scary. And if you say you did have a computer that wasn't capable and you clicked on that uh, icon, um, it will pop up with a box saying, let, let us verify your computer. And sometimes it will go through the verification process and say, yes, your computer is ready. 
and it's still not. Um, there are drivers that are not uh, available for your computer to be able to run certain uh, parts of your computer, so your mouse or your uh, sound card. I touched on this a little bit earlier, but um, that has been something that a ton of people are complaining of, so be careful about that. Uh, is there a way to turn that off? Um, not really. Uh, unfortunately, there are some things that are like aftermarket, like bootleg stuff, where you're going into the directory and changing it. And it's not. I would definitely not recommend that. Um, so, I, I, basically, long and short of it is no. I, I, there isn't really a good way to turn that off. Um, it's it's been in the butt. Yeah, that is a challenge, no doubt, and and one of those things that. I want to get back to questions in a minute, but I want to just show a couple of additional slides quickly that sort of relate. Mm -hmm. That you may find that you are getting that update prompt a lot and that your machine, or maybe you have some machines that are running mission, mission critical uh, programs that are not compatible with Windows 10, um, so you need to keep them on old, older machines. But if you have older machines that are win running Vista or XP and that are really not going to be compatible with Windows 10, Windows 7 is being will no longer be supported after November. I really would recommend that you spend a little bit of time looking at your budget to see when you can make some upgrading of your machines because your hardware really uh, may need to be changed out if you really can't get an operating system that's going to be supported on it. Um, so I want to just highlight quickly, we mentioned earlier that Spencer works for interconnection.org, which is one of our partners in our Refurbished Computer Initiative program. I am going to get back to questions in a minute, but I wanted to just show you that we have uh, access to donated and discounted desktops, laptops, tablets, hotspots, projectors, and a lot more, not just through our RCI program, but through a couple of additional programs. So you can go to TechSoup.org slash hardware if you are needing donated or discounted hardware. So you can get those peripherals if you need a new monitor, if you need uh, new desktop PCs. Uh, we have them it ranging from low tier to high tier, but they are all considered business grade uh, refurbished, factory refurbished uh, machinery. So they have been uh, taken through the process of getting them back up to speed. Many of these are what are considered off-lease. So some of these bigger companies lease their computer equipment for two years, and then they get in a new batch of computers two years later. And those two-year-old computers are still high-end business grade machines that are just taken, cleaned out, updated, refurbished, and then put back out there through some of these programs. So the Refurbished Computer Initiative program is at TechSoup.org slash refurbished hyphen computers hyphen catalog. So you can find uh, a lot of different resources there. I'll just show one picture of some of, some of the examples of what's available. These are uh, provided by our relationship with Interconnection, so Dell Optiplex computers. These ones are coming with Windows 7 installed. Many of them also come with um, Office 2010 installed. So you are getting not only an operating system, but you are also getting uh, Microsoft Office. So you don't have to purchase that as a separate uh, license or request it as a separate donation. Some of them are bundles where they include monitors, keyboards. Some of them are just the tower. And there's also uh, laptops and tablets and things like that available. And I'll also mention the Dell Affiliate Program for a $10 admin fee. This is a discount program that Dell offers. So it's available through TechSoup.org slash Dell. You pay the $10 admin fee and it gets you access to the Dell uh, website with substantial discounts on their hardware. So if you're looking for brand new hardware, this is an, a new option that's just been released in the past few months here through TechSoup. So if you're thinking of buying some new Latitudes or Optiplexes or whatever they're their latest, greatest uh, hardware is. Uh, and it also is for gear. So they sell cameras and um, backpacks and things like that through the Dell site. And this gets you discounts on all of that. Uh, so that's another additional option. Uh, I did chat out the link to uh, Microsoft uh, operating system donations. We have not only upgrade options, but if you have computers that are running uh, Microsoft Office, or not Office, I'm sorry, Microsoft operating systems, if you've got Windows licenses and you don't know if they're legitimate, uh, maybe it was a computer donated to you, or you think that the license that's on there, you don't have any idea who it originally belonged to, you can request full operating systems through the Get Genuine program, which I don't have a link for in here, but you can get to it from that operating systems link, um, where if you need full licenses that are legal, 
Microsoft uh, Windows operating systems, you can get that through our program. But it is a one-time only ever request. So if you think you might need five computer licenses for an operating system uh, this year, but you think you might have a couple in the closet that you're going to need next year, you need to request them all at once because you can only ever do that once to get full, uh, full licenses, not just upgrade licenses. So I just wanted to mention that because it's important to know that it's only one time that you can get, get access to that. And you can browse for these things by browsing our catalog by donors. So if you know you need Office uh, 2010, or if you know you need a Windows 10 operating system, you can go directly to the Microsoft section of our site by browsing by donor or provider. Or I, I highlight this because you can browse, browse by category or solution. So you can browse for um, hardware. You can browse for um, software programs. You can, so there's a bunch of different ways to look around the site. You can browse by solution. So like looking for computers and electronics will take you to the section where you can see new tablets, smartphones, laptops, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get back into questions, but I just wanted to highlight those resources for those of you who do need to upgrade equipment. And I'm going to leave this screen up on the on the or this page up on the screen while we get to more questions. But these are just some of the resources that I've pulled out uh, that can help walk you through whether you need to invest in new hardware. Uh, information about refurbished hardware and how to select the right hardware if you do need to purchase any. And then we've got resources on DIY troubleshooting, so more on the same topic that we covered today and how to configure and set up multiple computers if you're running a computer lab or have uh, the need to clone or do imaging on different machines. We have an older webinar on BC uh, PC troubleshooting, and then we have the webinar that was on upgrading your Windows OS, one of the tips that uh, was recommended uh, to upgrade and also not upgrade if you don't know what you're doing. This is uh, an event that we did with a couple of experts that walked through the things to do before you bother even trying to upgrade to make sure that you're protecting your data and information. So back to questions. Um, we have a question asking from Jennifer, uh, their computer is equipped with Windows Defender. Is there anything else that's needed as far as security is concerned? Do you think that it's enough to have Windows Defender that's pre-installed, or do they need anything else? Um, I, I think that uh, you know, like the Adblock Plus is a good thing to have as an extension on your browser. Um, and I, I think that um, if you get into Malwarebytes, which is a free version, uh, you don't want to set up malware bytes as your antivirus program, where it's checking to, uh, you know, for viruses. Um, that's what you know your antivirus program is for, whether it be Norton or um, Windows or Microsoft Security Essentials or what have you. Um, that's a very targeted approach towards getting a certain thing for malware. But um, between those three things, I think that's a good base level. Um, to protect yourself. There are other things, but it gets really complicated. Um, you know, dealing with like routers uh, for your protection. Um, uh, there, there are other things, but as far as just programs and applications, I would say those are a good start. And then just having good, um, good habits whenever you're surfing the internet, so that you don't get into anything that you, uh, you shouldn't. Great. Yeah, that is good advice. And I would recommend checking out that security section of our site for resources on the safer habits so that you can mm -hmm. adapt your own uh, behaviors to be safer. Um, let's see, we have a question Brian asks, and I don't know if you have recommendations. I can re recommend some folks, but are there any suggestions for how to identify an IT partner to assist with this kind of maintenance? Uh, you know, if you need regular IT support, uh, how do you recommend that people find that? I can make some recommendations if you don't have any, but I'd love to hear if you have any. Um, yeah, so I, I generally speaking, I, I work through, uh, since we're a nonprofit, I work through the nonprofit network um, to be able to find uh, good IT solutions in, in, in certain areas. Um, so I, yeah, I, I think that uh, Becky, you'd be a good person to refer to on that. 
Yeah, and I would say um, you know, around the country we have been uh, connected with NPower which is which actually started through a Microsoft grant to help nonprofits with their technology. And there were originally 12 NPowers in various cities around the country. A lot of them have changed names now, so depending on where you're located there may be one near you. I would also recommend um, N10, the Nonprofit Technology Network has a a section of their site that's affinity groups and listservs that are called 501 Tech Clubs. So it's 501s for nonprofits, so nonprofit tech clubs. And those are listservs where you can sign up to one that's local to your area. Uh, they're not in every area, but they are in a lot of the cities around the U.S. And you can post there to see if you can find a consultant. Uh, you'll pe see people on their list, uh, hey, I have a website that needs to be redone? Can you make recommendations for a company to do it? Or here's my RFP, my proposal for what we want done. Submit your, your proposal for it. Um, so it's a great place I think to connect with other consultants and contractors. We also have some contractors that we work with through TechSoup that um, we have relationships with. One is Tech Impact, and they do phone support and maintenance. So even if they're not local to you, which they're located in uh, Pennsylvania, but they also have a new affiliate in the D.C. area. But they offer phone support, so that's one option as well. Um, we are just about at time. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and just move us to a couple of these closing slides uh, while I ask another question just to wrap us up. Um, but feel free folks who are watching the screen, go ahead and chat in one thing that you've learned today um, so that we can continue to improve our work. Uh, we have a question from Don who asks, Adobe is really bad about asking to update. Should we say yes or no? Do you have an opinion on Adobe's update requests? Uh, yeah, I mean uh, Adobe, um Java, stuff like that, those are main programs that you're on your computer, and you do need to keep those updated um, just because they're, they're doing those patches not only for functionality but also for protection so that your computer isn't vulnerable. So main programs that you put on your computer, uh, I would definitely recommend keeping those up to date. Great. And for folks who are interested in the RCI computers uh, that come with Windows 7, you can also then request to have an operating system upgrade through uh, our program, our donation program, if you wanted to bring them up to a Windows 10 machine as well. So that's one option that somebody was asking about in the back end. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and wrap us up. Thank you so much, Spencer, for spending that hour with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, I'd like to invite our participants to join us for any of our upcoming webinars and events. Any of you who uh, participated in any of our storytelling, digital storytelling events in the past couple of months, I wanted to just let you know that we have um, the contest submission deadline. So if you are looking to uh, send us your short video or photo story as part of the submission where you can win up to $7,000 in prizes. The deadline is coming up in just a few days, so be sure to do that soon. Uh, and then we'll have a webinar on PowerPoint for Beginners. So if you are new to this uh, PowerPoint tool or want to uh, increase your skills in it, join us for that. And we'll talk about how to get tech donations before fiscal year end, which is coming up on June 30th. So join us on the 7th to learn how to do that. And then we'll have one uh, for beginners on Microsoft's OneNote. We'll spend some time on video editing and production with Adobe Premiere. And then we'll have a couple that are geared more toward libraries and literacy communities, one on the privacy topics that are happening in libraries, how to respect your patrons' privacy while also allowing information to flow. And then we'll have one on helping children build their literacy skills in this digital age where everyone's glued to their devices. So feel free to join us for those and keep an eye out for more. You can also visit our webinar archives on uh, TechSoup's site for any of our past webinars to watch. Thank you so much Spencer, and thank you to Susan in the back end. Lastly, I'd like to thank our webinar sponsor ReadyTalk for providing the use of their platform to present these webinars. When we close out, please go ahead and complete the post-event survey to let us know how we did and what we can do to continue improving our program. Thanks everyone, and have a great day. Bye-bye.